Hello, welcome to C++ London, the May edition. We're going to be talking about uh, co-routines in particular uh, with uh, batch operations. And we've got a nice set of lightning talks to get through as well. But before that, as usual, I'm going to run through a little bit of news and uh, some other items. So if I press the key on the right machine, there we go. So after me, we've got the lightning talks, as I say. We've got uh, Kevin Henney, uh, Killian uh, Henneberger, and Arthur Dwyer. Then we're going to have uh, probably a little bit of a switchover break, and then uh, Francesco Zafoli is going to talk to us about, let's say, co-routines, um, and can they transform your code to do batch operations? Which is interesting, a different look at that. Now, I didn't quite finish my slides in time, so apologies for the transition there. Instead of telling you about the upcoming meetups, um, Harold at the, uh, the Sweden group has done all the work for me, and he's pulling off all of the uh, global meetups for C++ that are now occurring online. So if you go to this URL, sweden.se slash worldwide, you can see all the upcoming C++ meetups worldwide. So if you like this, you can find others like it uh, throughout the month. That's a great resource. So thanks to Harold for that. Uh, back to C++ London. If you do have um, ideas for a talk you want to do in the future, whether it's a lightning talk, full talk, or something in between, uh, and even if it's not a fully formed idea or you want some help with it, do let me know by going to cpplondon.org slash speak and just putting a few details in there and then I can follow up and uh, we can capture that. So we're also on the lookout for good talks and potential talks as well. Okay, so I did this little video last time just to explain to everyone how this is all going to work. So I know a lot of people weren't with us last time, so just go over it again. If you're watching this on the, the YouTube channel, go to live.cpplondon.org instead. Um, the YouTube will be embedded there, but it'll also give us a few other things. So we have, um, just a bit further down, you've got uh, this uh, Slido uh, pane where we can ask questions. You'll see that in a moment. And also some uh, Jitsi rooms at the bottom. Uh, I find that this is the best configuration. If you just zoom out until you can see all three on screen at once, ideally full screen. You can move between the Jitsi rooms just by clicking one of those links. Uh, it looks a bit different now. I've got to redo this video. Uh, so you found Jitsi works best with around 10 people. And I think for conversations, that's about optimum as well. So if you see a room is too crowded, move on to another one. I think last time we only used one or two rooms. So I've reduced the number a bit. Um, and then... You can also set up your well, set up your name so everyone knows who knows who you are. And if you have a gravatar, you can put that in as well. Um, let that video finish. Is that going to move on? There we go. And with Slido, you can ask questions, and I'll see those straight away. I can feed them onto the speaker at the appropriate time. Uh, we'll, we can also run polls on Slido. And you can also vote on other people's questions. So if you see a question, you think, oh, I've got the same question or something similar, vote on that. And then we'll get to the highest uh, rated questions first. And that will just help us to get through it a bit more quickly and saves everyone asking the same thing. So we'll, we'll run, run a few polls as well. So keep an eye out for those. Um, in terms of questions, at least in the, the main talk, what we found last time was that holding all the questions till the end uh, meant that we we just got too many questions. So I've, I've asked uh, Francesco to find some well-defined points during his talk that we can pause and just see what questions you've got so far, see if we, if we want to take some of them. So we'll ask the questions as they occur, and then we'll get to them at the appropriate time. OK, the other piece of big news that we have is that we've now finally announced the new dates for C++ on C. So C++ on C, of course, was going to be a physical event in June. That's clearly not going to happen this year. So after lots of deliberation, we decided to move it online. I also moved the dates back to July, 15th to 17th, 17th of July. Uh, and the workshops will actually run the week after so that we don't have people just online every day uh, for too long. If you, um, if you already bought tickets and you haven't had an email about it, do let me know because you should have done by now because... This is going to be a lot cheaper, so you'll get a refund 
or there's a few other options for you. Uh, and if you want to sign up now, it's um, £125, I think, plus VAT. Well, go, go to the website. It's got the prices there. Uh, that'll be more accurate than we're trying to remember, but it's uh, it's pretty reasonable. We are we're trying out some of the ideas that we want to use for how we're going to run the event in this very meetup. So you can all take part. So if you see anything that you don't think is working very well or that, that could work better or something that you like, do let me know because that's going to be useful feedback for running the, the conference. So enough about that. Final thing from me is, as usual, because JetBrains are the sponsor, um, we have uh, two free licenses for a year to give away. So to claim a license, send me an email at that address, phil.nash at jetbrains.com with the subject 19. So it has to be that subject, 19. That's it. And I'll pull all your names in a hat, a virtual hat, and I'll email the, the winners and I'll try to run that tomorrow. So if you're watching this on YouTube later, um, don't email me because it'll be too late. Unless you watch it very, very soon after. But use your judgment. Okay, so I am now going to go to the first poll. Uh, should have got this prepared, shouldn't I? I'm still working some of this out. Right. Share that screen. There we go. Right. Um, that didn't work. Bear with me. Okay, that should now be live. Uh, I can't seem to show it at the same time as I'm changing it, so I'll need to work on that. So there should be a poll up in Slido now. So if you're on that live.cpplondon.org page, then you should be seeing a poll now just asking about your familiarity with co-routings. That's going to be useful for uh, Francesco a bit later when we get to his talk. I'm now going to bring up our first speaker, uh, Lightning Talk speaker, and that is uh, Kevin Henney. So put him on screen. And are you ready for your slides, Kevin? I am indeed, yes. Excellent. So I'll put those up as well. I'm going to drop off and leave you in Kevin's capable hands. Kevin. Hi. Excellent. Oh, are, we around? Oh, are, we, are we good? Are we good? Are we um, happening? Excellent. Right. OK. Good evening, everyone. Um, or good morning or wherever you are. Uh, this evening, we are going to cover um, list. This is not me having bad, a bad font day. Um, there is a reason I have written lists like this, and it is down to the first letter, uh, the lambda. Um, so, yeah, this is list. So let, let's just get a quick recap, and we're going to go. It'll get progressively slightly off piste as we go, because uh, you think you know everything you know about. You need to know about lists, and you probably think you know an awful lot about lambdas. Um, that may not actually be true at this point. It will certainly be true in about ten minutes. Okay, so let's let's start with the really simple stuff. Okay, imagine I've got a list of words, standard. C++ 98 standard, uh, here's a list of words. Um, we can assert that it's empty in its initial state, push front a couple of times, hello world, size is two, the front is uh, world, pop front, and there we go, brilliant. This is all good. Okay, then we hit C++ 11, we get a singly linked list, forward list. Um, it was originally we called S list, and it was supposed to go into C++ 98, but it missed by 13 years and got respelled. Um, some minor modifications, same basic functionality, but certain operations have been shifted. Size is not constant time, so we'll just focus on empty. Other than that, it looks kind of similar. But if we really want to get into this stuff properly, you have to look at the granddaddy of all um, singly linked list uh, thinking. And that granddaddy is, of course, Lisp. Um, so that's a, uh, an image of my copy of the Lisp Programmer's Manual, uh, published in the early 60s. Actually, a really readable book. Um, highly influential, uh, and one of the nice things is that actually if you read it, it gives you enough information about how to build yourself a list machine and a list interpreter. Uh, so the basic premise is going to be we have singly linked lists, and th you know, they look un uh, unexceptional in memory. Um, if we imagine words look like this, but now I'm going to switch to using a bit of Lisp terminology. Um, 
if you want to take the head value, that's car, content address register, it's a legacy name. Um, if you want to take the tail, it's CUDA, okay, content decrement register. If you want to create a list, um, let's say we have a value X and uh, we take the existing words, then we cons it. So if you've ever seen cons in a piece of code, or so, that all comes from list. Now, one of the important things is that what differentiates this from something like a forward list, well, there's a couple of factors. The one, one of the most obvious ones is representation sharing. So if I decide to take the original words and I con something else to it, then I'm going to end up with this. The tail of the, um, uh, uh, the or the, rather the unchanged nodes remain genuinely unchanged and shared because we are given certain guarantees. Certain things do not change and therefore representation sharing is referentially transparent. And I was really taken with this idea. In fact, I used to be really taken. I, I wrote, uh, I used to write a column many years ago for uh, CUJ um, and I wrote in uh, one article, um, a fair share uh, part one, let this be a lesson to you. Never, ever number your um, uh, your columns or your episodes or anything like that. I was told this originally when I started being a columnist in the late 90s. And I asked why. Why not? Because logically, this is in two parts or three parts. And they said, oh, yeah, you know, because... Um, because we can't guarantee the mag uh, that you will deliver the second one, and we can't guarantee the magazine will continue to exist. As it happens, I the, the only time I ever did this was the one time there was never a part two. Uh, anyway, I digress. At that point, I, I said, uh, yeah, I wrote this. I still have a deep fondness for the list model. It is simple, elegant, and something with which all developers should have an infatuation at least once in their programming life. And I explored this. I explored some gratuitous overloading, but then I explored what was really the core model um, and tried to make it a little more STL-like. Uh, and I ended up with an insanely cute name, Lisped. Um, so a Lisp-style uh uh, STL type, type list. So it would have the vocabulary we're familiar with, the push fronts and all the rest of it, but would uh, actually internally only hold const values and would therefore support representation sharing. Um, and so therefore, instead of the syntax we had before, you're going to end up with something like this. You're going to end up with um, words, then words.front, that'll give you the front value, subtle shift on pop front. Pop front doesn't return void, popfront returns the resulting um, list. And that's the whole point. This is this, we're moving to a much more value-based paradigm here, um, functional immutability, whichever way you want to look at it. So therefore, um, it returns the resulting list. So popfront doesn't change state, it just simply navigates down. This is what makes it so cheap. You don't actually take a copy, you actually return um, the next link in the chain or a wrapper that uh, embodies that. And likewise, push front, same deal, push front results in that. And to demonstrate that, what you'd end up with is push front Y, you'd end up with a shared representation. And the original words would be, unless you'd otherwise assigned it, would remain unchanged. And this pretty much passes the tests that we had for forward list, um, but with some minor, with some minor mods. Um, so that's all very similar. But notice the style, stylizing. Um, the style is different in the way that we call it. The style being, we take a result, we apply an operation, we take the result, and that is our new version or our new view. And it's better thought of as a view. This is a persistent data structure. It's better thought of as a view. So we rebind words to the result of words.push front. We rebind words to the result of words.push front. So we use the variable, the same variable, to track it. If we hadn't used that, we could have handily used another variable, and the original words would have remained untouched. And all the tests passed, and all that's good. Now. There are a couple of interesting questions here. One of the ones, and actually part of the motivation of the whole uh, article series, was how do we actually represent this? How do we actually implement this? And the obvious way to implement a singly linked list looks something like this. Okay, you have an internal link, you're going to hold the value, and then you're going to have a link to the next one. Okay, and, and, that's, and that's it. Nice and simple. Kind of. The simplest representation well, how are you going to deal with the representation sharing? The most obvious way to do this is with garbage collection. Now, this was when I originally wrote this, this was 2002. Garbage collection had not really been explored. A lot of C++ developers um, still 
didn't know about it or were unaware of it or had some kind of 1980s vision of what garbage collection was. But as a systems programming language, um, one of the things I noticed is that C++ has been progressively marginalized through the early 21st century because the one thing it couldn't talk about was the systems that you were running on. Um, for example, um, systems have dynamic libraries, but C++ didn't have a standard way of uh, dealing with those, with those. Systems had threads, but C++ didn't have a standard way of dealing with those. Systems were increasingly providing runtimes um, that supported garbage collection, and C++ had no opinion on those, and, and ultimately led to the invention of things like C++ CLI, because C++ was not a good systems programming language. Um, so C++ 11 had some ideas about garbage collection. Sadly, they weren't very good ideas. Garbage collection is optional and has been since C++ 11. This, to describe this feature as almost entirely useless is, is a little bit generous because it's very difficult to write portable code to something that is optional and which you can't make a compile time decision on. So that means if you do write stuff like this, you either end up with a memory leak or, and the, you know, it's just not supported, you end up with some garbage collection. So therefore, C++ 11 developers, C++ 11 plus developers, will reach for the tool that they think is the best solution. Oh, I really wish people would use SharePoint quite so much. Um, it, it looks like it's the solution, but it isn't in this case. It actually makes this more complex. Um, uh, the simple example that I'm going to demonstrate here is, um, uh, is this simple fragment of code. Here's a block of code, and we're going to count down and we're going to just push back 42, and we're going to keep rebinding. What you need to keep in mind is that when you hit that closing curly, the destructor is going to be called. And that destructor will then call the destructor of basically through shared pointer, you're going to end up with this cascade, Let us say, because everything is going to be at a reference count of one. The destructor of the first one is going to drop that. Uh, that's going to drop the reference count down to zero for the next one. So the destructor for that will be called. In other words, you're going to end up with a recursive call. Um, so it turns out that you don't need very many values. Um, you don't need very many values before you actually blow up the stack because um, you've ended up using recursion where you probably didn't mean to uh, for a linear, a very simple linear uh, thing. So in other words, yes, you can solve this problem, but it's not as simple as you thought it was. Uh, however, the real fun comes with, uh, so this is in its current form, not safe for work, but I'm also going to show you something else that's not safe for work, not because it blows up, but it does have a really bad memory footprint. It's not safe for work because your colleagues will not thank you for it, but it is the greatest fun. And it really explores the use of lambdas, uh, to a much fuller extent, actually much closer to the original lambda calculus model. So, um, it passes. I'm not going to spend time on this. It passes the same basic tests as Lisp did, which is a variation of what went before. And what we're going to look at is we're going to realize that Lisp is an example of data abstraction. Um, we have an object model, and it turns out, as uh, William Cook observed in his 2009 paper on understanding data abstraction revisited, Lambda Calculus was the first object-oriented language. So basically, it dates back to, strictly speaking, it dates back to 1932, uh, but the variant most people are familiar with, the timeline starts in 1936, Alonzo Church, an unsolvable problem of elementary number theory. And he invented lambda calculus not so that people could geek out and, um, uh, and say, hey, look, all the computer science can be found inside lambda calculus, and not so that people could start adding it to their languages from the 1990s onwards um, so that they could program like it was 1936. Um, that was not his original goal. He had very different uh, objectives. But in this, you know, he said, I'm going to create a notation. We select a particular list of symbols consisting of curly brackets. Hey, parens, lambda, and square brackets, uh, and an innumerably infinite set of symbols to be called variables. That's great, because we have, with the exception of the lambda symbol, all of these symbols are present um, in C++. So there is a thing called a church encoding. And the idea of church encoding is that you can encode uh, numbers, booleans, data structures. And indeed, this is one of the classic examples. And actually, the work on lambda calculus is where we get the term pair from. Um, uh, and indeed, first and second. Um, the history of those predates actually programs. 
so pair first and second, I'm not going to explore the fun with lambdas that we can have here. But what we're doing is we are actually taking a lambda rather than treating it as a functional abstraction or rather using a functional abstraction to abstract data. This is really this is really quite cool. Now, what is interesting here is once you've got the, once you've got the ability to code or encode um, a pair, then you've basically got the ability to encode a list because that's all you need for a pair or rather from a pair. You can create a list because you have your first pair and then the second element is now another pair and the second and so on and so on. You just need to remember to have a terminating condition and that's a conventional one and there. But I am going to offer you something that is utterly ridiculous um, but great fun and is a very different way of looking at linked lists using Lambda Calculus. So we're going to start with something fairly, fairly regular. Um, it's templated, it's list. You can construct it. That's the default construction. It'll be an empty list. No surprises there. We need the help of a um, another constructor, which we're going to keep private. This is the consing constructor. So in other words, this conforms to the cons we had earlier on, where cons takes a value and it takes the rest of the list. And that's exactly what we've got. But we're going to keep that one private. We, that's nobody else's business. We want people to use our public interface, which is going to consist of functions, isn't it? Absolutely, it's going to consist of functions. It's going to consist of function objects. Um, what we've got here is um, functions, empty, size, front, pop front, and push front. And what we now need to do is make sure that during construction, we initialize them appropriately so they have the right behavior. So first up, you're going to get, for an empty list, we don't really need, you don't need any data abstraction whatsoever. It's it's empty when you create it. So therefore it's hard coded to return true. The size by definition is zero. The front, well, it has no front and we've decided we are not going to have um, the joy of undefined behavior and we're not gonna have exceptions. Um, front is going to, we're gonna return optional. So that's a null opt. And then pop front, uh, well, that's just going to be an empty list. We're going to make that the identity operation. If you try and pop, um, if you try and uh, take the uh, the front of an empty list, that's just going to be an empty list. It's going to be the identity operation. And then push front, that's the fun, that's the cons. And that's the piece of magic there. And we see that constructor being employed there. So that is our empty list. Now, we've got another constructor we need to define. Okay, so this class or this behave, the behavior of all of this class is just going to be defined through two constructors. There are no member functions. Here, one of the things that we know is it's not empty because by definition, it has at least a head. It might be an empty tail, but that means it has at least one element. So therefore, um, we've got um, all of these values. Um, we've got the return, um, uh, we've got return false, it's not empty. We've got one plus whatever the tail size is for our current size. The head is whatever we passed in as the head. The tail is whatever we passed in as the tail. And push front, well, that's consing again. And we have a cons of a cons in that uh, uh, in that particular definition of the lambda that we are now initializing to be our function object that is public data. Now, there's a little bit of tidying up here. The simplest tidying up we can do is uh, be a little more specific with our captures and then there's a little optimization if you look at that size that's a that's got a uh, that's on it's got a linear cost actually we know exactly how long the list is at this point it's however long the tail is plus one we don't need to do that at runtime or rather we don't need to do that on call we can actually do that at the point of initialization um, reducing it to an o1 cost and with that we have seen that lambda is indeed the ultimate c plus plus thank you very much Back to you, Phil. Thank you, Kevin. If you hang around for a second, we do have one question. I will do, yes. Well, a, a question yes. and a, a comment. Uh, so I'm going to try and have another go at bringing this screen in. Bear with me. <laughs> Having a great record on this so far, but oh, there we go. So um, the question that uh, Gashba has, actually, I, I had a similar question because it's something I've wrestled mm -hmm. with as well. Why did you choose uh, to use the terms of the STL without the mutability? Of the STL doesn't that risk satisfying concepts syntactically but not semantically? I've got a slight yeah, variation that's a, on that question. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, and indeed, the original article all those years ago, I initially didn't explore, I didn't use the STL terms at the beginning of the article, but they ended up using them towards the end. Um, so some are, some are no brainers. Um, so let's deal with the uh, the obvious no brainers, which is that um, uh, things like front. 
uh, that's now going to return a value that we can use. But now I've adapted it to be optional, which kind of really we want anyway. Um, so that's a, an upgrade. If somebody said, let us reinvent the STL now, um, that is, I would expect something like that. The um, the love of undefined behavior, I think, is possibly less than useful um, in uh, uh, many uh, classes of system. Uh, for const operations, most const operations such as empty and size, there's really no competition there. Um, push front and pop front, that's a really interesting one because obviously those are historically side effect uh, inducing. And over the years, whenever I presented related concepts, I have varied a little bit in how I presented them here, I just did it in the more classic way. I'm going to take the terms and yet yeah, I'm not going to satisfy them originally semantic, uh, semantically. Um, if you like, there's a kind of a halfway house on the semantics is I'm kind of doing what you expect, but not quite uh, in the way that um, something like uh, a sort routine that returns a sorted result rather than sorting in place. Semantically, we're kind of expecting it to be a sort but actually we're just using a different convention set. So yeah, there's a halfway house here. Historically, I have also used, in fact, um, when updating the slides, I took them from something where I'd used uh, more, I guess, adjective style forms, descriptive forms. Instead of push front, I used pushed front. In other words, this is it with its front pushed. So the vocabulary is close enough that you can say, oh, I understand what it's related to, but I'm not treading on the same namespace or the, the same name set. Um, so it's a judgment call. And honestly, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't read too much into it um, in, in this particular context. I'm quite happy to change that. Thank you. But what was your related question? Um, well, it was, it was very similar. It was more about the interface, which I think you covered as well. Yeah. I mentioned that I wrestled with this myself when I've written pure functional data structures before. I've tended to write the um, the core data structure as a pure functional interface. So it always returns a new instance. Yeah. And then I wrap that in an interface that is inherently mutable and sort of matches the STL, but operates internally in terms of these functional objects. And you can always get at the, the pure functional objects if you need it. Otherwise, you can treat it. Okay, like so that's, a, that's effectively that's a you're you're creating a wrapper facade. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and so in other words, both levels are present, and we know there's no secret. Um, there's no secret that what's happening behind the scenes um, is uh, the, the what's happening behind the scenes is um, the immutable version is actually there because of the relationship there. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, it's a necessary relationship. Yeah, yeah. Um, in this one, uh, this actually formed the basis of a library that was never written, a thing called FTL, Functional Template <laughs> Library. Um, I, I basically laid the groundwork for that, but I never progressed it. I got the basic implementations. That's where I copy and pasted the original code from. Um, and the FTL, I was, I'm going to use some of the names, but yes, I am going to change some of the return conventions and uh, the constants and so on. Uh, and the idea is that in code, you would see a sharp distinction because of the namespace usage. Um, that's not to say there couldn't be confusion, um, but that was a decision that I took at that point. Um, okay, okay, the next question. Oh my God, Kevin is an, an absolutely <laughs> mad lad. Yes, I take it. Um, and in fact, I, my, family, my family will vouch for that. Um, uh, and but I'm going to offer them the in the best possible way in case they had any doubts. Um, We've does got a this couple not more questions from... coming in? Yes, Can I, I, I see those. Yeah, yes. Um, I want to move on because we've got a few more talks to go through, and then if we've got time, we'll come back to questions at the end. Otherwise, Absolutely, we'll that's brilliant. Yeah, that's okay. sure. Okay. Thanks very much, Kevin. I'm going to uh, drop you out the screen Thank you. for now, if I can. Um, there we go. And I'm going to bring up Killian. There he is. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, Killian. And are you ready for your slides? Where are they? Here? There they are, yeah. OK. Perfect. So if you're all ready to go, I shall I say good luck. And see you in a few minutes. Thank you. All right, yeah. Also, welcome from my side. Um, my name is Killian. And I actually put a view of maps here on the slide such that you can see from from where I'm talking to you. So from uh, from Aachen, actually, west of Germany. Um, and it's nice, nice to be here online at Zypiris London. Um, I'm going to talk about the polymorphism decision table. And it's actually quite nice coincidence that last time at Zypiris West London, um, Klaus was talking about no paradigm programming. And for those of you who haven't seen the um, talk, 
it's it's about the idea that C++ is not only an object-oriented language, but offers a lot of other um, programming paradigms. And especially with um, relation to polymorphism, we not only have the option to use um, base classes with virt virtual or pure virtual functions and derived classes who override those, but we actually have a lot of other options too. And with all these options, um, C++ as, as usual offers a lot of flexibility, but it also comes um, with the cost that we as developers have, have to choose between all the options. And so I want to present um, a little table which might, might help you to find what's the right decision on, on polymorphism. And I also um, want to first uh, go th uh, with you through the different kinds of polymorphism. Um, what you maybe also have encountered in your, um, in your work with C++ is, or maybe also other programming languages, um, is that on the, on the left side of the image, we see um, maybe what we call um, interface-based polymorphism. So you first define some kind of interface. Here in the example, I took a logger interface. And then you use that interface um, through your code base um, in your in your library or whatever um, code base you're working on. And you never know what the actual implementation is of that interface. And you actually don't care about this. Um, you just know there's this interface. I can program against that interface. And later on, maybe even after you, you ship your library as a build binary, um, we can use different implementations that satisfy this interface and can be set and maybe also exchanged at runtime by certain customers or users. So you can have maybe by default a binary file logger, which logs to binary. Um, and maybe someone can exchange it by console logger, or you can have whatever custom logger. And as long as they satisfy this interface, um, they can be interchanged without any problems. Um, the next kind of polymorphism is what you see in the middle of the image that you have um, yeah, possibly unrelated types, um, like in this example, a double string, bool, etc., um, which are actually not related. They don't have common base classes. They don't have common virtual functions or whatsoever. Um, but they make up what we call a JSON value, right? Uh, double would be the, the number in a JSON value, for example. And when you work with JSON, then you want at runtime have maybe all, always one active um, JSON value, so one alternative of these uh, types that will be active and that could change at runtime. And that's a different kind of polymorphism here. And in the last picture on the right side, um, we have a classical object hierarchy, how you could also find it in other languages. Um, this is an example from Qt, where we have a Q widget, um, which is the basic type for, for, for controls in, in Qt. And you can inherit it with your custom widget type. Um, and also QG uses it to inherit its um, abstract button, radio button, and push button from it. And here, in this case, with the Q widget, um, you have common, common fields that you can put in that class. Um, you can have default behavior. And in your uh, deriving classes, classes, you can override that behavior. And there's yeah um, four categories, actually, I think by which you can categorize or distinguish between these um, different kinds of polymorphisms, uh, which I want to show you in the polymorphism decision table now. So this table in the first column lists these four properties. So we have the set of types that I want to use polymorphical. Um, it can be closed or an open set of types. Um, I have the set of functions which can be closed or which can be open. I um, might want to choose the semantics. So do I want to have value semantics or do I want to have reference semantics? And the last property is whether you're going to have a com base class or not. And depending on what, um, yeah, what, what values these categories have for your um, current polymorphic problem, um, you might end up with different solutions. So if we read um, the second column where we have a closed set of type types, a closed set of functions. Um, we have value semantics and no common base class. This would more or less be um, what we had on the last slide for the JSON value and where we could end up using a variant of all the types I listed in the circle 
um, as our polymorphic solution to that problem. And there are other solutions too, um, like for example, in the third column using a polymorphic value um, where you specify a base interface and can use a closed set of, uh, sorry, an open uh, set of deriving types, um, but of course also a closed set of deriving types and use these polymorphically while preserving value semantics. And um, I won't go through the whole uh, decision table. I, uh, I'm sure you can get the, the slide afterwards, um, but this can be helpful to yeah, get an overview in which situations you might want to use which kind of polymorphism. So um, the SP, the smart pointer case would be a typical case where you have your base class and have deriving types and want to have reference semantics. But we're not forced to use that. We have different different options in C++. Um, yeah, as this was only a high level overview, I added some sources that you can uh, look up afterwards. Um, I linked the talk from Klaus Eagleberger from the C++ London um, meetup from last time. Um, if you don't know um, about Variant yet, um, which is part of C++ 17, uh, which is part of the standard library since C++ 17. Um, I also added a link to Bartek's coding blog. Um, if you want to learn more about um, type erasure, um, there's a good talk from Sean Parent from 2017. I think he originally got this um, running in this world of C++, started um, talking about that. Um, Arthur Dreyer gave uh, last year at the Back to Basics track a very good and informative um, talk about that. And if you want to know about polymorphic value, um, then there's a link to the GitHub page of Jonathan Coe. Um, yeah, and with that being said, I, I want to hand over to you again, Phil. Thanks, Kevin. Great talk. I've got a, uh, well, one question and a comment again, which I'm gonna try and bring up uh, there. So you'd be pleased to know Klaus has chipped in to say very valuable addition to my talk. Thanks, <laughs> Killian. I think that means he's going to steal your material. Yeah. <laughs> so, so be careful about that. Yeah, thanks. Um, just above that, um, the, the question there, I think that came in just at the beginning of your talk. So I think it relates to your talk. <laughs> Can we not have a single function with a different integer to get different behaviors to avoid many functions and fill a result buffer instead? I'm not quite sure whether that relates to your talk or not. Does that sound like that one was um, for you? No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't no, say I so. I, I, I it might be related to having a list with like n elements in the beginning. Right. Yeah. So because it came in just at the beginning of our talk, it may have just been delayed yeah. and actually related to Kavlin's. So um, maybe if that was for Killian, you can ask that one again, or, or perhaps we can discuss in the uh, the Jesse room afterwards. Sure. So. If anyone has any more questions for Killian, um, keep them coming, but maybe mention in the question who the who the question is for, just to make that <laughs> a bit easier for me. Um, meantime, thanks, Killian. I'm going to drop you off the stream now, and going to bring in Arthur. Hi, Arthur. And is your mic on? You're muted at the moment. Let's try that. Does that work any better? That's much better. Yes. Oh, good. Okay. And hopefully, uh, when we get the the feedback that we had uh, when we were testing beforehand, but yes, all going um, well. And as I told Phil before, this mic has been giving me some difficulty uh, yesterday and today. So if it does cut out, yeah, Phil, you know, notify me. Uh, yeah. But this should be short. Um, okay. Can we bring? Ready for me the, to bring uh, in your? Yeah. This one. Yes, yeah. this one. And if if you have. Uh, seen a lightning talk by me in the past uh, month, uh, you'll see it again. Uh, this is a magic trick. This this is uh, the lightning talk I plan to give at C++ Now 2020 before it was canceled. Um, and it was inspired by a talk that Rene Rivera gave at CppCon uh, 2019, where he did a card trick using the STL algorithms and had you know a volunteer up on stage. I think it was Sean Parent up on stage, uh, you know, shuffling around cards uh, using algorithms to find his card. Uh, and I thought that was pretty cool, uh, but it was more of a math trick than a magic trick. Uh, there wasn't, I mean, it was a, it was a procedure, but it wasn't really a trick because you didn't get tricked. Um, at least I didn't. I, it wasn't supposed to trick you. This one's supposed to trick you. Um, 
So again, I have a physical deck of cards. I um, guess I should show you guys in random order, right? Um, so I have this physical deck of cards, and I have uh, the C++ version on your screen now, and there's a link to the Godbolt, so you can follow along at home if you want. Um, so here I have a deck of 52 cards. Here on the uh, Compiler Explorer, I have a, uh, a string of characters. And uh, I'm going to look at just the last three characters of the string, so just the last three uh, cards in the deck. Pull up the last three cards here. And uh, you know I can see them in my uh, monitor here because they're on my webcam, but uh, that's fine. The, you, the important thing is you just pick one of them. Um, and this is where I'd get a volunteer from the audience. Phil, if you're still there, you want to pick a card? You want to pick one of these three cards? Or if not, I'll pick for you. Uh, seven of hearts. Ah, Let's should see. I say that, should I? <laughs> so one, oh, so that is number one, the, the back card. The, the uh, card yeah, take, back. That, take that one. All right. All right. Um, oh, wait a minute. You said seven of, did you say seven of hearts? That's the one on the front of the deck. <laughs> um, yeah, I spoke too soon. Yeah, let's try that again. Of these three cards, pick one. Uh, and these correspond in our C++ version uh, where the deck is this magic trick uses namespace std. So S then here, D. T. T, the middle card, number two here, second from the back. Um, all right, so I square up the deck. I'll keep it visibly use nothing up my sleeves. Um, and down here in the C++ version, um, your card was T. All right. Um, second from the back. And so here in the C++ version, uh, I am uh, printing out the fact that there are two cards, right? T is the second card from the back of the deck and asserting that indeed, if I take the end iterator of the string and I go back to T is actually there. I haven't done anything tricky. All right. So now I'm going to square up the deck. I'm going to prepare to manipulate it. Now, a string view is immutable. In C17, I can have a string view that points to an array of characters, but I can't uh, shuffle them. I can't uh, sort them. Uh, I'm not allowed to modify the string. If I want to modify the string, I have to use this, this thing hey man, in C20 called uh, stispan. And so a span is just like, like a string, but I can, I can modify the element. In particular, uh, I can use STL algorithms to permute their order. Uh, so what I'm going to do three times here, or sorry, you pick card number two. Card number two, the T. This, this is why I have, why I have no. Uh, um, so two times. I'm going to take the top card of the, of the deck, and I'm insert it somewhere random them in the middle of the deck. Deck. I could be showing you. I'm doing it somewhere random in the middle of the deck. Loop, deck loop this way. And then for two, off top. Anywhere ran, random in the middle deck there. Then nothing up my, my sleeves. All right. Um, and by the way, I, uh, that's a rotate. All right, I make my, my spin and, and I pick them in insertion here. And I uh, do a rotate to that la last card from the top into, into the middle. And again, second time, I'm last card in the middle. So now, now your cho chosen card has been buried somewhere in the middle of the deck. So then I have to get it added out. And to do that, I'm going to use magic. Jack. I'm going to use some, some magnetism here. I'm going to, to uh, just rub the top, top of the deck like this. And uh, I'm going to try, try to bring your, your card, try to make it stick to my finger and rise up out, out of deck higher than any other card in the deck so that I can feel it. And then I can, I can pull it. So I'm going to rub. And I'm going, going to lift. And a card is, com com a card is coming, coming up. I sure hope, hope your card. And... If, if we do the same thing in the C++ code, of course, to find a card that's higher than any of the other, the other cards, uh, we use just the max algorithm. Uh, and so I take, take the thing, the, the max element there, and, and ask, is this this your card? The card of the deck is your chosen letter T, second from the top of the deck. That was my card. Oh, good. I'm glad I'd kind of forgotten. And that's the magic trick. So, so magic trick with, uh, with physical cards and with uh, C++ at the same, the same time. Well, thank you, Arthur. That was magic. <laughs> thank you for, ha for having me. I think any sufficiently advanced Arthur Dwyer talk is indistinguishable from magic, so... <laughs>
Thank you for that. Uh, I don't think there's any questions for that, which um, maybe not surprising given the material, other than maybe, you know, how did you do it? But nobody asked that. Yeah. Uh, but maybe there'll be some some chat in the chat rooms afterwards. So thank you uh, for, to Arthur again and to all of our speakers so far. We have our main talk coming up uh, in just a moment. Just going to, we're going to go off the air just for uh, a minute. Well, we'll still be streaming, uh, but but nothing coming up. Just to give us a chance to switch over. And then we'll be back in, in just a few minutes time. So bear with us. Okay, hey, welcome back, everyone. Before we get into uh, Francesco's talk, uh, we might just have a few minutes just to get back to a couple more questions for Kevin, since he did have so many. In fact, a whole long list, ironically enough. So I'm going to bring uh, Kevin back into the stream. Hi, Kevin. 
Uh, it turns I... out that that last question was for you, after all. So I, I right, excellent. That. Okay, so. Um, let's answer the one that's at the top of the screen. Isn't lambda-based implementation uh, all the functions, including copy constructor, destructed with ON complexity? In this one, um, the uh, poster is referring to the lambda-based implementation, uh, which I described as being not safe for work. This is one of the many reasons it's not safe for work. It is intended as a piece of fun. Please, please do not um, actually do something like this at work because it, it will give you a copy cost. Uh, but however, just to clarify, it's not all of the functions. Uh, copy construction and destructure, these are ON, but um, the uh, default constructor is not. Hooray. So, um, uh, And the rest of the functions aren't functions, so they don't really count. Uh, but yes, it is intended as a piece of fun. The, the joy of that piece of code is demonstrating here is a list that actually has no ordinary member functions um, and actually has no ordinary member data um, and building it out of that. It is built purely out of closures. Um, that's the idea. So yes, I definitely, that was why I decided to put in the big hashtag NSFW. This is not intended for industrial usage. The Lisp, however, is suitable with appropriate memory management, that kind of design is suitable because it is a, um, a, a decent uh, persistent data structure with a number of performance benefits. It's just you have to watch out for the uh, deallocation. So that one is uh, uh, on the other side of the NSFW boundary, but it's NSFW just in the shared pointer implementation. Um, which I think addresses, does this not suffer from a similar pointer to the shared pointer recursion with lambdas calling other lambdas? Um, actually, the lambdas don't end up really calling the other lambdas directly. It's actually the function destructors. But again, I want to point out that it, that's a piece of playful code. Do not mistake that as being in the same class of code as something like the uh, Lisp, which is intended and is appropriate for industrial usage with a little bit of uh, tweaking of the uh, memory management. Um, I'm not sure I understand the second question, Dan. Can we not have a single function with a different integer to get different behaviors to avoid many functions and fill a result buffer instead, if that is one for me? Um, Apparently it was. Uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure I understand. Is there an opportunity for the original poster to clarify? But perhaps now with the clarification that the Lisp was intended as, like, that's actually a real thing. And the final list that was purely made out of Landis was just a bit of fun. And let's not take that one too seriously, except for the mind bendingness of what you can do with Landis and not having ordinary data. Okay, well, thank you. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, sorry, I, I'm just seeing, yeah, uh, Arthur's pointing out, it's referring to a common type of resiridium. Um, right, oh yes, yes, yes. No, I'm with you, I understand, yeah, yes. Uh, I understand where the perception's coming from. Arthur's highlighted, it's referring to a common type erasure idiom, but what you're doing is really type erasure. Um, yeah, the types are, the, the types remain relatively intact. There is, you might say that there is, there is an erasure going on, but it is not, uh, the types are all up front. So yeah. Right. Yeah, no, I'm Arthur, with, I'm of course, with you. is yeah. our resident expert on type erasure. So if you want to know what type erasure is, ask Arthur. <laughs> okay, thanks, Kevin. I'm going to um, drop you off the stream again and bring Francesco in. Hi, Francesco. Hello. Hi, right, so you have the main slot tonight. So put your slides up. Uh, so Corabatch, I'll, I'll let you discuss what that is. And I'm going to hand over to you now. I'm going to drop off the screen. Francesco. All right. Can you actually put up the result of the poll? Yes, I forgot you about that. that um, yeah, let's do that. So put this back. And Here we go. So most people have heard of them, but never used them. But you can see the results there. Yeah. Then we have quite a few people which are familiar from other languages. And uh, a surprising 22%, which is familiar in C++, but not the final version of C++. And finally, we have a 8% of uh, co-what. And uh, hopefully, <laughs> there's going to be something for everyone uh, in this talk. Excellent. I'll put your slides back. So right. there are some more polls we're going to run, and I'll bring up the, the polls at the appropriate time. Uh, you just let me know Perfect. when to do them. So, All right. Here you go. So hello, everyone. Uh, it's nice to be here. It's an usual time for everyone, but we can still share our passion for uh, C++. I'm uh, Francesco Zoffoli, and uh, today we are going to look at core batch and uh, how to batch operation simply using coroutine. 
along the talk, I'll stop several times to uh, take questions. So if you have any questions, just put it in the poll and uh, hopefully there won't be long uh, before uh, we are going to get there. So let's get started. Uh, in this talk, we are going to present uh, the problem that Korobach aims to solve, an idea that we can be using a uh, use to solve it. Then we are going to jump into uh, how coroutines work in uh, C++ 20 and how we can use them to implement the idea we discussed earlier. And finally, there are going to be some conclusion. Hopefully, there's going to be a takeaway uh, for everyone. If you're already familiar with coroutines, hopefully you're going to see a cool application of coroutines. But if you're not familiar with coroutines yet, uh, this talk is going to give you a brief introduction on how they work. And hopefully, you're going to have a better understanding of what they are. So let's jump into the problem. Batch operations tend to uh, be uh, better than a single uh, operation. There's not a single definition for what is a batch operation, but in general, it's something that could process multiple data or perform multiple actions all at once. Typical, typical examples of operations which benefit from being batch are networking, uh, file input output, uh, memory allocation, uh, GPU draw calls, and in general, there's a common property uh, on this, and this the cost of performing an operation is composed by a fixed part, and then the part which depends on the number of data or uh, operation to be performed. And this fixed cost is not uh, minimal compared to the other cost. So if we look, for example, at examples that I gave before, uh, in network latency, sometimes the round trip can be uh, longer than the time it takes to transfer the data on the wire. Or uh, while writing a disk, uh, the disk seek might be longer uh, than the, uh, writing the data on the disk. Or similarly, in a database uh, table scan, uh, the time uh, uh, that it takes to scan all the records is uh, bigger than the time that it takes to check the condition of the table scan. So Phil, can you bring up the second poll? Yep, um, bear with me. So uh, in your day-to-day -day work, have you ever faced a situation where batching uh, an operation, uh, batching something gave you a major win? Um, if you have, please share it uh, in the poll that we have live now. Sorry, my attempt to make the poll live backfired. It's gonna try again. <laughs> Okay, I think it's live now, yes. Sorry about that. All right. So maybe we can continue and we can go back to the result of the poll as the first, uh, we stop for the first uh, question. But if you have any experience with, uh, uh, with that, please uh, feel, share, uh, feel free to share it. All right, so moving on, um, uh, we can see uh, an example of uh, this batching uh, situation and we can analyze uh, a specific situation. For example, let's say we want to send a notification to a group of users, uh, respecting the preferences this user has. In this example, the, the operations which benefit from being a, a batch are the fetching the preferences and sending notifications. And we can assume there is a, a function which takes a vector and return a vector and performs this operation. So if we were to simplify the code, um, we could uh, write something similar to uh, what's on the slide. For every user, uh, we call a function which gets the preferences of the user, passing the ID, and then we will check in the preferences whether the user wants an uh, email notification. If, if they want it, we can send it to the email of their preferences. Notice that when we are calling the function, we are actually passing uh, a vector and receiving back a vector, and that's why we have the curly bracket and the at. Uh, in a get user preferences. But we just said that batching is important and the code which uh, we just wrote uh, does not uh, batch. So let's try to rewrite the code, uh, batching the calls and sending all the, uh, fetching all the preferences and sending all the mail uh, just in one call. If we were to use the standard algorithm, we would uh, uh, write code similar to the following. 
So in this case, we have a vector of user IDs uh, and uh, we would have to extract the ID with a transform. Then we would call the get preferences and following that, remove the elements uh, which are not, um, do, not, do not want to receive the email, followed by extracting the email from the preferences and then send the notification. We can see that the code is completely different from uh, the uh, one we saw initially, even if now we are doing batching. The logic is there, but we just need more effort uh, to um, understand it. Additionally, in this slide, there's actually a bug. Uh, can you spot it? Uh, Phil, could you open the uh, third poll, please? I've just made that live. And maybe, can we see maybe the results of the previous poll, if anyone uh, shared some uh, example? So I'm not sure I can show the results without making that one live again. Erase, remove. Yes, exactly. So we can see in the in the slide, someone noticed that uh, we are calling uh, uh, remove uh, remove if, but this actually doesn't remove the element. They just put it at the end. So when we are doing the transform after, uh, we are uh, sending notification also to the uh, users uh, which opted out not to receive notification. So we can see that the, there's a. Uh, quite a readability, readability versus performance uh, trade-off uh, in uh, this uh, situation. Uh, the code is different. It requires more effort to understand. Um, we could say it uses extra memory because we need to keep vectors for all the intermediate steps that we do to extract the values that we need. And additionally, since we are modifying the vectors, we can't as easily uh, use const. Uh, throughout the talk, and uh, so far, I talked about performance, but uh, performance is not a single number. And uh, it could be considered throughput, it could be considered latency or efficiency as work done over resource usage. In uh, some cases, you might have uh, uh, rate limits that you need to respect with the number of calls you need to do, or maybe you're paying a cost uh, for a monetary cost for each call that you're doing. For example, if you're using external API. So uh, what performance means is different and uh, different properties are important in different situations. Uh, but in general, I think batching can help in many of these situations. Any questions so far? Don't think we have any questions yet. Uh, I do have the results of that, um, that other poll though. You wanna see those now? Yes, please. So here we are, I think that's, oh, there's more actually, so. So yeah, some people batching. said no. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> we have some uh, batching computation allow to parallelize them better. Reading data points over serial line from a PLC, typical overhead would be uh, roughly 10 data points. Read requests originate from different asynchronous processes. Data point requests are pulled. The oldest one is selected and it's combined with the nearby data points, yes. We have, yes, when parceling out work to worker nodes, Grouping work correctly is a major performance boost. Yes, oodles of time, but I'm not sure I can think of a specific example. Yes, networking. So in general, there are many different situations and we can see that uh, they actually cover different, uh, 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 different environments. So let's see how we can approach uh, this, uh, um, this problem. And let's look at it. What if we could keep the readability of the first code and the batching behavior of the second? So the idea here would be that if we could, uh, for each, uh, before going into each iteration of the loop, store the parameter passed to the function, and then only continue the body of the loop after we gathered all the parameters, we could execute this function in a batch mode. So let's imagine that instead of having a for loop, every user has its own piece of code, kind of like a thread, but not being a thread. And this code can execute independently. In this case, uh, we can see a diagram. In the diagram, we have the red arrow, which is the current execution. 
and the blue arrow is where we suspended. So let's go, we go, let's imagine we go through the first uh, block, uh, the code for the first user. When we reach get user preferences, uh, we store the user ID into some kind of batch and we suspend the execution of this code and we move to the next one. Again, uh, the as we reach uh, get user preferences, we store the ID and we suspend the execution, moving to the next one. And so on, we perform the same operation. At this point, we gather the uh, uh, parameters for all of the get user preferences, and we can perform a batch operation, getting the result for all of the users. We can then resume uh, control of the first batch by, uh, by starting the execution and getting the preferences back from the set of results that we obtained from the batch uh, operation. At this point, this uh, uh, code has the control, and we can continue executing along uh, this uh, line. And as we reach send notification, we can imagine then again, we are going to block and store the preference email uh, in some batch. In this case, we are not going to show it. And similarly, we can continue in the next block, uh, get the preferences, continue the execution, and as soon as we the other function, we suspend the execution and we move on to the third one. Until we exhaust all the results that we got and we advanced all of the functions uh, to the next function. So this will be uh, the main idea of uh, the talk. We are going to start executing a batch until a batch operation is reached. Then we are going to record the argument to that operation and stop the execution of the code. Following that, if we did not record enough arguments, we start the execution for the new input. Otherwise, uh, otherwise, we execute the batch operation. And finally, once the batch operation is performed, we can resume the stopped execution uh, for the batch operation. And the nice thing is that curtains allow us to do exactly that. And we, we still don't have any questions. I think they're ba being batched up for the end. <laughs> Perfect. Or maybe everyone is understanding everything perfectly, and it's great. Yeah. Oh, no, we, actually, we just had a question come in. Maybe we can go straight to that. So yeah. live as it happens, uh, why not use any of the established existing library-based or language-based tools for SPMD programming, which would also be able to perform vectorization, et cetera? SPMD, I imagine it's something along uh, SIMD, single. Could be a typo. Or... I'm not familiar, but variant. I imagine that's uh, something like that. And that, that's definitely true. Uh, compilers can be very good at uh, vectorizing, especially numeric loops. Uh, but it's very hard for a compiler to uh, vectorize your call to a database to fetch data or your call to uh, an external API. Uh, to um, uh, get some data. So while in general, like if you're doing hard numerical uh, computation, it might be just the best choice. Um, the approach we're going to see today is something different, which allows you to uh, batch higher level operations, but also get a guarantee that this is batching. Uh, while there are some, um, there are some situations where Small changes to the code change the output vectorization and how it's generated, and it has a big performance uh, impact on your application because you don't actually control and you can't tell the compiler stop compiling if this is not vectorized anymore. While the, in uh, in this approach is uh, deterministically batched, uh, but that's definitely definitely true. Like if if your compiler is vectorizing and just write simple code, uh, and it's going to be performant. Yeah, so the follow-up question actually gives the answer to that. SPMD is single program, multiple data. Yeah. So I, I Kuda, yeah. yeah. It definitely makes sense in the in depends on the on the situation on of your uh, of your operation. If if that's the best uh, the best solution, definitely go with that. Okay. Thank you. All right. So back to your slides. Uh, for everybody else, um, do ask questions as they occur to you, and when we get to a question point, we'll we'll ask them then. So over to you. All right. So let's see, coroutines. So coroutines as are resumable functions and uh, a coroutine can start, can suspend the return control to the caller, can be resumed at the last uh, suspend point, and then it can terminate. 
and the uh, suspension and resume can happen as many times as necessary without no limit. In C++, coroutines are stackless, which means there is a materialized option which contains the state uh, in uh, or the required state for the coroutine machinery to start and stop, and uh, they need to return control directly to the coder. There are mostly two components that uh, are used to interact with coroutines, the promise and the handle. The promise is in an object which is used uh, from the inside of the coroutine to interact with it, while the handle is used from the outside of the coroutine. And we are going to see both and what this means. Finally, uh, a function to be a coroutine must either use co-await or uh, co-return. So one of the co keywords needs to be uh, in its body and it needs to return a type which defines a promise type inside which satisfy a specific concept. In the, the feature of the coroutine we are going to present in the talk is actually a subset what coroutine in C++ 20 can do. And uh, there are many customization points, but for the scope of the talk, uh, these are the fundamental parts and it's going to enable us to implement our idea. So how does a coroutine actually look like? Uh, we can see here a function called mycoro, which returns a task, which is a type which we will define. Uh, this coroutine initially prints in the standard output, then awaits an asynchronous operation, and then uh, returns. In this case, coreturn uh, will not be needed because uh, the coroutine returns uh, void, but it was just to show uh, all the keywords. So let's look at the handle. The handle is uh, basically a node owning pointer, which points to the coroutine state. And uh, the type of the of this handle is std experimental curtain handle with a diamond sign. This is because this curtain handle can point to any kind of curtain. But if you know what is the promise type of the specific curtain you're interacting with, you can specify it uh, as a type and you're going to get additional behavior. The two main operations that you can perform on an handle is resume to resume the associated curtain and destroy to destroy the curtain and all its state. If you also have a coroutine uh, with a promise type, you have the promise method, which gives you a reference to the promise associated with the coroutine. And you also have the from promise static method, which creates uh, a, a handle from a promise. So this is a factory function. Let's look into co-await. When a coroutine reaches co-await on an awaitable object, there are a few things that happen. First, the compiler inserts a call to await ready. This call uh, needs to return a Boolean. And if it's returned true, uh, we skip point two and three. Otherwise, we continue. Then the coroutine is suspended. And the compiler uh, inserts a call to await suspend, passing the handle to the current coroutine. This uh, function uh, needs to schedule the handle to be resumed at one point when the awaitable is going to be ready. When the coroutine is resumed, um, the compiler inserts a call to await resume, and the return, express, uh, return value of this function is going to be the value of the co-await expression. And after this, the body of the coroutines continue execution. Let's see an example. Here, the coroutine is messaging the awaitable and says, yo, awaitable, are you ready? And the awaitable in this case is ready. So, the coroutine can ask directly what's the value and get the value back. And notice there's no suspension here. The coroutine just synchronously continued execution. Sorry. Um, let's look instead of a different example. In this case, uh, the coroutine messages the awaitable and again asks, are you ready? And the coroutine is not ready. So the, the awaitable is not ready. So the coroutine says, call me at this uh, coroutine handle when you're ready. Notice the time at 11.20, the uh, awaitable tells to some executor uh, to call curtain uh, handle when it's uh, finally uh, executed. Later on, the awaitable uh, is uh, complete and uh, the executor calls curtain handle saying that the awaitable is ready. This wakes up the curtain and the curtain is going to message the awaitable again saying, hey, what's the value? And get the value and start the execution again. The last component that we are going to look at is the uh, promise. So when uh, the coro is uh, invoked, uh, the first thing that happens 
is that we allocate the space and we construct the curtain space, uh, the curtain uh, um, state. So this is the space allocated, and then the compiler constructs the curtain state. Following that, uh, we instantiate task uh, column column premise type. And we call the method getReturnObject. This method return, needs to return an instance of a task. And this is the task which is going to be returned to the caller once the coroutine gives back control to the code that invoked it. Following that, uh, the compiler is going to call uh, promise.initialSuspend. And uh, once it gets an awaitable, it's going to co-await it. At one point, the Execution is going to be uh, resumed, and when it's resumed, the body of the coroutine starts execution. Let's now look how the termination happens. The coroutine can terminate for several reasons. One is that we uh, hit a core return, or we, end at the, uh, we get to the end of the function, at which point the compiler inserts a call to promise.return void. Otherwise, we could hit a core return with a value, and in that case, the compiler will call return value uh, with the value provided. Or uh, finally, we could also uh, terminate because of an handle exception. In that case, the compiler automatically adds a call to an handle exception. Once one of these uh, function returns, uh, the compiler is going to invoke promise.finalSuspend and co-await the result of this function. The promise and the state of the curtain is destroyed automatically if final suspend did not suspend. So in the situation we showed before, when await ready is called, if it returns true, it just continues and cleans up everything. Otherwise, we need to manually call destroy on the curtain handle to clean up the curtain. And again, all of these functions, uh, except clearly the manual call to destroy, are automatically inserted by the compiler. Are there any questions? We do have a couple of questions. I'm going to put them right. up on screen now. So the first one says, very interesting talk, applicable to my job, um, is asking, are you uh, proposing a means to deal with errors in a batch where some fun functions fail within a batch? You did mention exceptions just after that. So maybe you covered it. And actually, no. Um, so the method we are going to see uh, is a uh, leaves you up to you to how you want to handle errors. There's definitely a way to handle errors. And uh, in the uh, real, uh, the, the complete implementation, which um, I had the link at the bottom of the slides, um, there is an example on how you would do it. Uh, but in general, it's up to you how you want to represent the data. So if you want to represent failure, you could have, uh, uh, instead of being a vector, you could have an optional vector, which would represent whether you failed or not, or you could have a variant, or you could also store a pointer to an exception, which you want you can rethrow in all the code. So the talk is uh, agnostic to the error, uh, how you want to handle errors. It's up to you to decide. You can use an exception or not. OK, thank you. And the second one was, uh, don't reactive extensions solve exactly the stated problem out of the box? I'm not familiar with the reactive uh, extension. It's possible. I will have to to take a look. Right. Yeah. It's definitely in the same space. I don't know if it, I would say it's exactly the same. Um, okay. That's all the questions for now. So I'm going to put your slides back up. Oh, hang on. Speak of the devil. Uh, so, sender receiver plus algorithms was a great way of expressing failure in batches. More of a statement. But um, any thoughts on that? Sure. <laughs> I. <laughs> I didn't. Uh, I, I guess the sender receiver is uh, the um, related to the executor uh, proposal, uh, which was sender receiver. So I haven't used it uh, um, directly, but yeah, um, definitely there are many ways to handle uh, handle failures in batches, and uh, I think is partially once you have batches which fail, you kind of solve already the problem on how are you going to execute batches. So here we are looking a bit more towards, I have a bunch of operations and the more natural way to solve it is just to write a for loop, which is going to ignore batching completely. Um, so this is the idea of how we get to the batch. Once we have the batch, there are a lot of ways of executing the batches or handling the errors 
So there are many, many options there. Right. Okay, thank you. I to put your slides back. There we go. And pass you back. All right. Uh, so let's try and see some examples on uh, how we could implement use coroutines uh, with, uh, with this. So we are going to implement in a waitable. We are going to implement a task. And then we are going to see how the control flow uh, goes in a, a couple of snippets. So let's start with a very basic uh, awaitable. This is a waitable which does nothing, and it takes a template parameters to decide whether it's going to be ready or not. Notice that the await suspend just discards the handle. This means that we need to make sure somehow to resume the coroutine in a different way. Because normally, once the compiler called await suspend, is not going to resume the coroutine. It's up to you to make sure the coroutine is going to be resumed. So we can see that in this case, the awaitable returns void because we have a wait resume which returns void. And then the await ready, ready simply returns uh, whether the coroutine was, uh, the awaitable was so, supposed to suspend or not. We can now jump into, now jump into the task. And this is again, this is a task which uh, the only member it has is uh, an handle to the curtain, and it takes two template parameters which uh, specify whether it should uh, suspend at the initial suspend and whether it should suspend at the final suspend. The task needs to define this promise type and we can look into how it's implemented here. So when the, for the unhandle exception uh, method, we can simply do nothing. Uh, because our examples are not going to throw exceptions. Um, similarly, uh, the promise returns void, but we don't, don't uh, look at the results. So we can implement return void as an empty method. And uh, for initial suspend and final suspend, we can just return the awaitable we just implemented, uh, providing the two Boolean flags uh, to the template. Finally, the last remaining piece of the concept that this promise needs to satisfy is the get return object. Get return object needs to return a task. And here we are instantiating a task passing the handle that we construct using the factory method when we saw earlier on the handle. Any questions so far? No additional questions at this point. So uh, carry on for now. All right, let's see some examples. Here we have uh, a curtain foo, which returns a task saying no suspend that does not suspend at the initial suspend and does not suspend at the final suspend. The task simply prints foo.0 and then returns. And we also have a main where we pre first print main.0, then we invoke the task, and then we print again main.1. If we were to execute this uh, code, um, that's what would we see in the execution. First of all, we start at the main and we see main zero. Then uh, we invoke the task. As we saw before, the compiler is going to allocate the state and then uh, instantiate the promise type. After that, it's going to get the return object, which gives us back our task, and then call initial suspend. Initial suspend uh, returns as an awaitable, which does not suspend. Uh, you can see from the first uh, template parameter of the task. And uh, um, so await ready is going to tell us true, it's ready because it's not supposed to suspend. Because of this, the compiler immediately calls await resume and continue the execution of the curtain. We then print foo.0 because we are into the body of the curtain and then we reach the curtain, uh, the curator. At this point, the compiler inserted a call to return void and then a call to final suspend. Since final suspend, again, uh, is going to give us an awaitable which does not suspend, we have await ready, which returns true, and we continue immediately uh, the curtain. We can see the await resume is invoked, and then the curtain is cleaned up automatically. Following that, we return back to the main, and we print main one. So what we just saw is a very complicated way to call a synchronous call, to make a synchronous call. Let's move to a different example. In this case, we suspend at the start of the curtain, uh, but we don't suspend at the end. So again, we start in the main and we print main zero and uh, we call the task. 
we allocate the promise and we get the return object and we call initial suspend. This is going to give us an awaitable, which is going to suspend. So await ready returns false and await suspend is invoked. This suspends the coroutine and returns back to the caller. At this point, we continue where we left and we can print main one. And then through the handle that we have in the task, we are going to resume the coroutine. When we resume the coroutine, the compiler is going to call await resume on the awaitable and then start the execution of the body. We print void uh, dot zero, and then again, we return. And similar to before, uh, the, all the functions are called and the cleanup is done automatically. Let's see another example. In this case, we suspend both at the start and at the end. Like before, uh, foo is going to uh, create the return object, call initial suspend, and suspend at that point. We are then at main dot one, and we can continue by calling resume on the end. This is going to call wait resume and then start the execution of the of the body. We print uh, foo dot zero and then we reach return. At this point, after calling the usual return void, um, we call wait the return await suspend. In this case, it actually suspends. So the compiler is going to call await suspend. At this point, we return from the resume function in the main and we continue printing main dot two. Since we suspended in the final suspend, we need to make sure to clean up manually our coroutine. So we need to call t.handle.destroy. And this is going to uh, call the destruction, the structure of the promise type and deallocate the memory. Note that at this point, calling resume will be uh, undefined behavior because the coroutine uh, uh, reached past the end uh, of its uh, uh, return statement. Finally, we can see an example in which we co-await uh, uh, an awaitable. So again, we can see the task uh, which uh, hits, uh, hits foo and uh, it creates uh, the state and the task uh, like before. And we go back to uh, main dot one. Following that, we resume, we call await resume and then we print foo dot zero and uh, we hit reach co-await. Co-await uh, is going to return uh, false because we are an awaitable which is going to suspend and uh, is going to call await suspend and return back to the caller. At this point, uh, we are in the main and we are going to print main point uh, dot two. And then we continue with uh, resuming the function. Once we uh, call resume, uh, the compiler is going to return from the co-await in the foo function and we continue uh, printing foo.1. And finally, we hit uh, co-return, which is going again to return void, final suspend, await ready, suspend, and we go back to the main. And then main.3 and then destroy again. So basically, we can see the back and forth that goes uh, between the coroutine and the, uh, the main controlling code. Any question? So no questions technically, but somebody actually posted a question to the poll. I think they may just been on the wrong screen. So I'm just gonna bring that up. Here we go. Yeah, the top one there. So uh, shouldn't task in main have template parameters, e.g. task true comma false? Uh, yeah, while I compiled the code while doing the uh, execution, uh, it's uh, to try to fit everything in the slide. There might be some uh, small typos, uh, but mostly if you uh, copy paste the code into like any uh, like um, any file and you fix the small uh, compilation problems, is going to run uh, with the um, as shown. Okay. I couldn't fit it all in this slide. Initially, I also had the define which were printing the function of the name, but it's hard to get code which is uh, readable. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. So I'll pass you back now. All right. So let's look at how we can implement the idea. Um, so we saw that we can have uh, multiple execution in parallel. We saw how we can suspend execution and now we can resume execution. So at this point, we have everything we need to do what we wanted to do. The idea is going to be then to transform the loop body in a coroutine, use await to interrupt the execution and store the arguments uh, of the function, and then schedule the next coroutine. 
Following that, we execute the batch when we have all the uh, necessary arguments. And again, once the batch is executed, we can resume the function with the result. So here you can see the tentative uh, idea on how we want to transform the code. From the left, where the body is inside the for loop, to the right, where we have uh, basically the same logic uh, inside of a, a coroutine. And then we are going to call it with the appropriate users. To implement this idea, we need uh, somewhere where to store the arguments. And for this, we can create a struct uh, batch. This batch has a vector inside with the curtain handle, and this vector is going to contain all the handles of the curtains which are waiting for this batch to be executed. Then, for simplicity, we are going to have a vector uh, which contains the argument and a vector which contains the result. And finally, a Boolean uh, which uh, um, tells us whether it's ready or not ready. So to answer the initial question uh, that uh, was about how we can handle failures, in this situation, this is first we simplify using a vector. But here you could have any data structure which could represent your failure. So for example, if your batch can have a single failure where the whole batch fails, here you could have, uh, for example, a nullable of vector result. Or for example, if all of your elements could have individual failures, you could have a vector of nullables of uh, the type. So here it's uh, up to you how you want to handle the storing of the arguments and the return type of the batch operation. Once we have uh, this, uh, we need to um, in implement the task because coroutines need to return a task. We can see here that we are implementing the uh, required uh, methods um, very similar to what we did before. Uh, the task actually in this case doesn't even have a handle, so we can just return uh, the task with the uh, a default implement uh, constructor. And the only uh, difference we can notice is that in uh, initial suspend and final suspend, we are returning this never suspend type. Never suspend is actually in the standard library in a STD, um, in a STD experimental. And it's equivalent to the awaitable that we implemented using the no suspend template flag. So this uh, awaitable always uh, stop, uh, never stops execution and uh, discards the handle completely. So we can see that the code that we initially wanted to write is actually calling co-wait on get user preferences, but get user preferences return as a vector and we can't call co-wait on a vector. What we need to do is to put some of our logic in place of this code. To do that, we can wrap the function, uh, the function with our wrapper, which intercepts the operator call and is going to return an awaitable. So this wrapper contains the um, operator call and uh, a method execute, uh, which we are going to see later. It also has a reference to an executor and it contains the function which we are wrapping and uh, a short pointer to the batch, which is the current batch where we are putting the arguments while we are waiting for, uh, uh, for it to be executed. The intercepted call operator uh, is going to get a value and uh, add the value to the list of arguments which are waiting in the batch. And then we are going to get the current index in which the uh, element is. Then we can imagine there's a should execute function, which is going to tell us whether we should execute the batch or not. In this case, we could imagine, for example, that we are going to execute the batch once it reaches a certain amount of elements in the argument. And finally, we return an awaitable with uh, a shared uh, pointer to the current batch and the current index of the element we just inserted. And we can see whether there's any question so far. No more questions at this point. So carry on. Perfect. Um, so continuing on, uh, we can see uh, how to implement the awaitable. The awaitable, again, has the uh, three methods that we need to implement. But in this case, given the batch, is extremely simple to uh, uh, implement. We have await ready, where we can just look into the batch, whether it's ready or it's not ready. When await suspend is called with the handle, what we need to do is add this handle to the list of uh, coroutines which are waiting for the current batch to be executed. And finally, Await resume is going to be called once this batch is already executed. So we have access to the result and we can simply uh, get the result, which is at the index of the same uh, argument that we put in the batch. 
The last uh, piece that's needed for uh, the task implementation is the execute method. What execute does is it assigns to the result of the batch uh, the result of calling the function with the arguments that we stored so far, and then we set the flag ready to true. After that, uh, we just execute the batch. So we need to start executing all the coroutines which were waiting for this batch to be executed. And this is where the executor is used. We can schedule all the pending uh, coroutines on this executor. And then we can create a new batch where we are going to start appending the new arguments as new operations are going to arrive. Note that here uh, we are dropping one of the references uh, uh, to the batch. But we have still several awaitable, which have uh, references to sh the share pointer. So the share pointer is going to be alive as long as there's a coroutine, which is still waiting on this result. And this guarantees that we are already accessing uh, valid memory. We cheated a bit in the initial uh, example because um, we wanted to intercept the call, uh, but we were calling directly the function. In this case, to uh, allow us to call the a wrapper instead of the function, we can pass it as parameters. Uh, and that's why we have the outer references uh, as additional argument to provide the, uh, the functions to actually be called. The last piece for all of these is the implementation of the executor. And the executor is a simple structure which contains a queue of curtain handles and has only two methods. One is schedule, which takes a vector of handles and put them at the end of the queue. And one is run. Run iterates through all the elements in the queue and call resume on each of them. It also returns true if it performed any work or false if there was nothing to do. And we can see whether there's any questions so far. There is there is one question. It's a bit of a comment, um, and it, it may be worth just having a quick look at. Uh, somebody wants a poll who actually understands what's going on. So. I think it is uh, it is fair to say if you're not really familiar with C plus version specifically of co routings, um, this can be a lot to to take on. But bear in mind this is being archived on YouTube. You can go back and um, work through it again at your own pace, um, and make sure you understand one part before moving on to the next. But if there's any opportunity to explain any any parts a little bit more, uh, maybe maybe that's a signal to do so. Uh, if there's any questions specifically to a part, I can go over it again. Uh, but I definitely agree. Uh, coroutines are very complex. And uh, this is part uh, why I wanted to explain it. At the end of the talk, there's going to be um, a couple of references to um, articles which explain more in depth what's going on. And uh, I de highly recommend it if you want to work with uh, coroutines. They've been great uh, resources for me. And uh, I definitely struggled at the start to understand uh, what's going on. There's a lot of jumping, and I think this is a, um, a, a very valid uh, criticism to uh, what is uh, is being presented. Thank you. All right, I'll, I'll let you carry on. Put your slides back. Yeah. And I'll drop If there's any questions specifically, like please add it on, and maybe later we can go over it again um, or uh, exp try to explain it a different way. So we can look at the result of uh, all the code that uh, we wrote and how we will be transforming our uh, function. So we can see in the code here, our uh, send email coroutine, which uh, takes the user, the new wrap function, and uh, uh, code-wise, it looks very similar to the initial code uh, that we saw. At the same time, uh, to be able to uh, use what we wrote, we also need to instantiate the executor and wrap the two calls uh, in our wrapper. Finally, uh, we can iterate through uh, the users uh, like the initial loop was doing. And for each user, we call our um, coroutine. Finally, we need to make sure that everything is executed to competition. And that's why we have uh, a while loop which continues executing the, uh, um, the coroutines which have been scheduled and uh, forces execution of our wrapper. But let's look more onto why we need this last rule. So a coroutine can either uh, be in a completed state, so it reaches the, reach the correct turn at the, or the end of the function, or it could be waiting in a, an executor because it has been scheduled, 
or it could be waiting in a batch because the batch has not been executed yet. So we can see that when we execute a batch, some coroutines are going to end up in executor waiting to be scheduled. And once we start to run some coroutines which has been scheduled, some might run to competition, but some might eat another co-await operator and be, end up in a different batch waiting for it to be executed. So we need to repeat this step uh, at point two uh, and three uh, until all the coroutines uh, reach the done state. And this is why the run method on the executor tells us whether there was any work that was performed or not, so that we know that all the coroutines have been executed. So let's see if there's any question on this uh, part. So we have one question, but it's got a couple of upvotes. So uh, sounds like a good question. What about storing accidental references to past arguments? So I guess the question is regarding what if I take a reference and I store it into my batch so that basically once the routine continues execution, um, this becomes a dangling uh, reference. And uh, in this case, uh, depends a bit on the lifetime of the of your uh, um, of your references. So if you're capturing, for example, let's say your routine is a lambda and you're capturing something on the stack, as long as the routine terminates execution while the lifetime of your variable is still alive, this is not going to be a problem. So the secret in this case would be not to instantiate a routine and return it. That's when it becomes uh, um, risky. The other thing is that if you have references in your uh, um, in your routine, the compiler makes sure to not uh, destroy these um, at suspension points. Um, so you can reference in the uh, in the body of the routine a variable across suspension points. But clearly, when you're implementing your uh, um, uh, the batching logic, it's it's up to you to make sure that you're not storing uh, references. So to make this simple, in the reference implementation I linked at the end, uh, there is um, uh, a concept that you can implement, which kind of abstracts this logic of batching and unpacking. And uh, this kind of makes you do it safely. But there are definitely some constraints on, on the routines, on the references. But as long as you don't tend to return routines, in my experience, while working with them, I didn't have uh, major problems with that. So the, the short answer is it's C++. There's always ways to shoot your leg off. Try not to do it. Um, then another question came in uh, while you were answering the previous one. Can symmetric coroutine transfer help with getting rid of this double loop? So symmetric routine uh, transfer, it was an extension uh, to the initial uh, routine uh, TS uh, a proposal um, in which uh, once you call await suspend, you can tell the compiler, I suspend, but actually resume this other routine, which is ready. In the reference implementation, uh, I link, I use a symmetric uh, um, symmetric routine transfer, and this is an optimization. It allows to start executing uh, new routines without going through uh, various hop. Uh, but this actually doesn't solve the problem. And uh, we are going to uh, a simple example is that imagine that the batch size for an operation is uh, four. So we are going to only execute something if we have four elements, and our vector only has three. So initially, we are going to execute these three elements, and then we need to force the execution of the batch with one of the call to execute. This is going to unblock these three elements, and they are going to be scheduled to be executed, at which point you need to call the executor. Once the executor runs, these three routines might actually end up in another batch call, which is the size of four. And uh, so un unless you actually know the sequence of calls that happen in your routine, basically the loop uh, is the safe way to make sure that everything advances uh, to the end. But if you can, uh, if you know precisely the list of the sequence of uh, calls that happen, 
you definitely can go away with the loop and just make sure that you call the executes uh, in the right order uh, to make sure that all the coroutines advance. So in our specific case, if we go, um, go back to our code. Okay, so here, for example, we see that we always get preferences first and then we also always send send notification. So we could call execute on get preference to make sure that anything blocking there advances to the rest of the uh, of the routine, and then we can call uh, send notification dot execute to again unblock anything that's blocked there. And we need also to execute call the executor in the middle because the execute is going to schedule something in executor. So you can see that this is very error prone, especially if you uh, have a for loop with an if inside. Uh, so my solution has been to uh, put the while loop and make uh, and make sure that uh, you always uh, flush everything. Uh, but symmetric routines have been uh, are a, a good um, a good way to actually optimize the code because this allows the compiler to write. Uh, we allow to skip a few calls uh, doing that. Okay, thank you. No more questions just yet. So I'll pass you back. Okay, so we can look at the result. Uh, we can see that for the specific of the uh, coroutine uh, body, the logic is almost unmodified. We only had to add uh, a call wait and basically uh, intercept the call with a uh, um, wrapter function. And, um, and this adds the batching behavior. This is also the advantage that adds a streaming uh, behavior. So let's imagine you have a very long list uh, of uh, users. Um, with this solution, you will start uh, fetching preferences and sending notification in batches that uh, stream through the user. So the first user could be notified while the last user has not been started processing yet. This might depend on the use case, uh, but it could be a nice win on the latency side. On the con side, that we see that there's a lot of boilerplate to, wrote, uh, to write around uh, uh, the um, coroutine. So while the coroutine is uh, four lines, we see that we need to have instantiation of executor, wrapping uh, uh, functions. We need to do the while uh, loop at the end, which actually is error prone because we could forget. And, and this means that some coroutines would uh, uh, remain uh, uh, unexecuted. It's also very hard to know what's going on in the code by just looking at it. Uh, as we saw like with a comment from uh, um, uh, in the poll, um, it's very hard to understand what is going on. And it needs to be, you need to be familiar with uh, coroutines to really understand how all the customization points are interacting uh, with each other. So uh, in my personal opinion, I would probably not adopt uh, this uh, pattern if in any um, production code base. Uh, but let's look at the conclusions. So we saw that uh, there's a trade-off in performance uh, between performance and readability uh, in, uh, in the initial example. We also saw that the C++ 20 coroutines give a way to give you take control of execution flow and allow very powerful pattern, but this comes at a big complexity cost. And so I would terminate with uh, this, uh, picture, which says that you were a lot preoccupied with whether you could do it, that you did not stop to think whether you should it. So I think in this case, it's uh, very interesting to see an application on where coroutines um, can take you, but you need to be aware of the complexity that this brings. You can see a more complete implementation of uh, this idea with uh, uh, a more uh, um, clear interface on how to do the batching operation uh, or how to handle error. Um, there are examples on uh, how to do these uh, with asynchronous uh, operations, because in this case, we saw that the batch was a syn uh, synchronous call, but you can also do asynchronously. And uh, a few uh, niceties at the um, link in the slide. And this takes us to the end of the talk. Thank you. I think I need to put together a sound ball with a sound of applause that I can introduce at this point. I I'm sure a lot of people are are clapping, whether they followed it or not. Um, but there is one more question we'll get to in a moment, um, just to give people time if they've got any more questions. Well, there's another one coming, so we've got two to get to. I just wanted to make one point, actually, talking about um, the complexity of this and how it could be quite hard to follow, especially if you're not already familiar with C++ uh, co-routines, or even if you are, 
this, this stuff can be complex. And a part of the reason for that, well, part of the reason is, yeah, it's C++. The other part is that these are inherently complex problems that we're trying to solve. If you're trying to do it without coroutines, and I have done, and I'm sure most people watching have tried to tackle some of these problems uh, without coroutines, they are complex problems, and you will end up with code that's hard to follow, no, no matter what. And coroutines are one step at trying to at least provide a consistent framework around that and, and offer some performance uh, optimization points for uh, the compiler as well. So that's just my my two cents on that. Let's go to the questions. So um, is there some estimate to the cost of the co-routine dance? Uh, it may yield nicer code, but potentially at the cost of a lot of extra effort. What do you have to say about that? OK, so in uh, the uh, implementation that I linked, uh, there's also uh, a benchmark. And uh, which I run on uh, on my laptop, so I can give you uh, values for uh, for my laptop. Um, but the overhead, uh, and in this case, I was comparing it to a, a multiply add. So I benchmarked uh, a multiply a multiply add, and uh, doing this uh, with the SIMDs and uh, the uh, anchor batch and the cost was uh, 90 uh, sorry 50 nanoseconds per uh, curtain so depending on your uh, on your use case um, it could be enough so for example if you're calling a database and uh, or you're calling an external service the value of batching uh, it's like outweighs the 50 nanoseconds per uh, item by far uh, if you're doing heavy numerical computation and your compiler is already uh, vectorizing, then that might be that might be uh, complex. Uh, but this is the order of magnitude I could get things to run. Um, the code becomes also a bit more complex because you need to take control of uh, memory allocation, uh, which is not super easy either, uh, unsurprisingly. Um, uh, but it all depends on the on the needs. And if you if you look at the uh, repository that. Uh, it's uh, uh, in the slides. Um, you can find the benchmark uh, you, with the code. Uh, there's the benchmark actually uh, benchmarks many different uh, conditions because there are several points which inter uh, introduce uh, overhead, and you can see the impact on uh, on uh, each of them. I remember during the standardization process, and you mentioned um, memory allocation a moment ago. There, there is a point where, uh, according to the standard. Um, a memory allocation should occur behind the scenes, but there's a reliance on compilers being able to optimize it out. And, and in most cases, uh, they were able to, or at least should be able to, but there's no guarantees. And I think the concern was not so much raw performance as predictability or determinism. I think that may be a valid concern, uh, but that was where the focus seemed to be in, in terms of overhead, uh, at least early on, earlier on during the standardization process. So, um, Go back, there's yeah. a couple more questions. And especially because in the end, this is uh, just uh, function calls. Uh, and the interesting thing, at least for me, was that while implementing this, uh, debuggers were fully supporting Curtin. So you can just step through the Curtin and the debugger correctly jumps to the uh, to the code. And uh, I was using a debugger, which does not even support uh, Curtins. So uh, I guess the limit is, again, the memory allocation, cache hit, and uh, instruction cache hit. As, as usual in uh, most of the uh, performance uh, code. And, and bear in mind what I said earlier, that because this is now a consistent framework, there is more scope for compilers to optimize. And early implementations may not optimize everywhere that they can. This is going to get better with time. So um, there may be more overhead now than that there will be later. Next question is, uh, how does this implementation perform in the degenerate case, i.e. batch size equals 1? Uh, so again, this was the, the I think it's uh, a bit similar to the previous experience. Uh, once you have uh, your compiler has full visibility on the code, uh, so everything is the same translation unit. Uh, in my experience, that was uh, on a laptop, so not a very modern one. Uh, the cost was uh, roughly um, 50 nanoseconds per iteration. Com Pairing uh, as a percentage uh, with uh, just a, a row loop. So basically, we are doing probably the worst comparison we can do for this code. 
it was, if I remember correctly, 50 times lower. So if you just need to add and multiply two numbers, I would highly recommend doing a for loop. There, there might be other reasons to do that as well. <laughs> um, and then uh, somebody wants to know what the state of coroutine support is in the three main compilers. Uh, so in my experience, all the uh, code uh, compiles on uh, Clang uh, 10. You need to explicitly pass the uh, minus F coroutine TS. Uh, to enable uh, coroutines. Uh, and uh, when I tested this, uh, which was a month ago, so fairly recent, Clang was the only compiler which could compile um, uh, the code. Uh, so I didn't test on uh, Windows. So I only tried on GCC and the Clang, and Clang is the only one that uh, manages to compile. I think there's progress being made fairly quickly on, on the compilers. I would imagine that GCC relatively soon is going to be able to um, uh, compile it. And uh, if you go back to this slide, I actually have a few with uh, uh, some references. And the third one is a talk from uh, Gore Nishanov uh, about using coroutines. And this, I think, was in 2018 and was using uh, uh, the Microsoft compiler. Um, so I think they might be able to. I just didn't, I didn't try. Right, there was the coroutines TS. I think was supported by uh, the Microsoft compiler, but I don't know about the final version. And when you tried GCC, was that before the latest release, uh, 10.1 came out quite recently with, with a lot of extra 20 I, support? Yeah. I tried on the head version uh, on uh, Godball, on the Compiler Explorer, uh, roughly early March, so I don't expect things to be incredibly different. If I right. remember correctly, GCC supported coroutines as long as they were no except. Uh, without exceptions, um, but don't quote me on this. Uh, double check, uh, but I'm, I'm sure like Clang works and GCC is going to uh, follow soon. I think. Um, yeah, somebody did say. Yeah, Dietmar says that GCC 10.1. They said oh, okay. should do it, but you need the F code routines flag, um, and the MSVC was the first to implement it. Okay. Uh, a few more questions coming as well. How do you handle the case of when there's two functions? inside a loop and a batch size for them is different. I do in the case in which the, um, so I think you're saying like, for example, you have a four inside the coroutine, uh, you have a for loop and then you have uh, one function and another function and they're different uh, batch size. In that case, um, you are going to, uh, this is where the loop at the end um, is very convenient because um, and with the loop at the end, I mean, if you can go back to the slides, mm -hmm. um, this, uh, this loop. Basically, this makes sure that you're advancing uh, the curtain. So you're going to basically execute uh, the uh, one function. Uh, it, it's important to say here that basically this is a scheduling problem. Um, depends on your behavior, you might want to just execute the batch, which unlocks the most uh, coroutines. And in the implementation in the link, that's actually what we do. Um, there's a function which uh, you can give it several wrappers, and it selects the wrapper which would unblock the most coroutines. So instead of executing everything, you just execute the one that blocks the most. If you have knowledge about the dependency graph, you might do something smarter. Uh, it's hard in the general case. Um, but uh, in the worst case, you're going to execute batches, which are um, the minimal size, uh, sorry, the, they are not going to be complete, but you're still trying, you're still going to batch depending on how many elements you have in the whole elements of coroutine. So if you're running these for loop for 10 users, uh, you're going to be able to advance as a, as a multiple of, uh, of uh, of this with a batch size, so it's it's not going to degenerate to a one element at a time, uh, but it's 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 more challenging for uh, for it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, there don't seem to be more questions for now. Um, are you going to be able to stick around and uh, join us in the Jitsi chat afterwards, yeah. Francesco? Great, and uh, hopefully. 
uh, our lightning speakers as well, if they're not already there. There was one other question uh, for uh, Killian that came up earlier, which was just about whether he'll be um, making his slides available. Um, so, oh, I see Killian there now. I'm just going to add you back into the stream, Killian. Yeah, I have a, um, yeah, I, I put them, uh, I put the slides on my GitHub page, and maybe I can, I don't know, where should I send a link to my GitHub page then? Uh, if you send it to me, I'll put it on the the Meetup page. So okay, thank you. But, yeah. So that answers that question as well. Um, I'll just bring Kevin back in as well. Uh, Arthur has uh, has gone for now, but I uh, just wanted to say thank you all for this, making this evening a success. And sorry about some of the little technical hiccups. Um, yeah, really good. And uh, I'm going to have to thank you on behalf of everyone else because obviously you can't hear their their applause as you might do otherwise. <laughs> Well, thanks um, for being a host, Phil. And we shall now um, drop off this stream, but uh, we'll be available, many, many of us at least, in the, the GC chat rooms. So see you all next time. See you. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you.